Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Collaborative Hydraulics, moving to the next generation of engineering. Uh, we're excited to have you here this morning. Thanks for waking up and making it to this session. Uh, with me this morning is uh, Mr. Roger Kilgore. He's one of our uh, experts from the consulting field, uh, from Kilgore Consulting and Management. And we're also fortunate to have one of our stakeholders, uh, J.R. Taylor, from, he's a hydraulic engineer from Montana, Department of Transportation. And he'll be presenting on his experience with our innovation this morning. A couple of our other team members that are not with us, uh, Joe Krolak, he's our principal hydraulic engineer from headquarters. Eric Brown is one of my cohorts um, in Baltimore. And Cornell Curreni, and Turner Fairbanks, Don Hendon, one of our stakeholders uh, from Mississippi DOT, uh, Veronica Gallardi, um, Central Federal Lands uh, Hydraulic Team Lead, and then Casey Kramer with Northwest Hydraulic um, Consultants, and he's one of our consulting experts as well. My name is Scott Hogan, and I'm with the Federal Highways Resource Center in Lakewood, Colorado. And this makes up our team. And to be honest, uh, we are excited to be part of EDC. This is essentially our first horse in the race. Um, this is EDC4. This is the first time you've seen a hydraulic innovation. And we are quite honored to be part of this, and we are excited to advance our discipline. So um, hopefully, by the end of this presentation, I'm going to have you so excited about innova our innovation, you're going to go back to your folks and say, we got to do this. All right, that's my goal this morning. Okay. So as we get started, if you would pull out your phones, and again, I told many of you yesterday, but if you participate, or if I told you earlier, if you participated in a poll yesterday, please text leave to 22333. Okay? And once you do that, then let's make sure our phones are working this morning. We're going to be using phones throughout our, our presentation. If you would then text FHWA1 to 22333 to reactivate it. And then, if you would, enter one of these answers here um, so we can get an idea of what the mix of folks is here this morning. So I'll give you just a minute to do that. While you're doing that, let me also let you know that um, I don't have a handout for you this morning because what I'd like to do is to send you more information. So if you would like a handout, please, or regardless, if you would sign up as we pass this around. And if you would like a handout, just check this column that says send me the presentation. I'll send you a PDF version of this presentation as well as recording uh, of the presentation that you can then forward to others. All right, so please sign up and, and just pass that around amongst the tables. Also, I've got a uh, stack, oh, they went over here. I have a stack of business cards on this table. You're welcome to take um, as you leave today. Okay. All right, so it does look like we have a majority of state participants. That's great. Has anybody had any trouble with the cell phone polling? All right, technology is good. So far, so good. All right, great, let's move forward then. Right, so it is time for change. Okay, that's what our presentation is all about here this morning. It's time for change. And why is that? Basically, the methodology that states have been using for many years and currently using for hydraulic modeling is outdated. It's essentially archaic in, in many cases. And in many cases, it's, not, it's no longer appropriate. Right? Yet, we're still using it. The tools that we're proposing with this innovation are not only next generation or current engineering tools, but they also, also involve graphics and other visualization tools that basically put better, better tools in the hands of engineers to provide a better quality product. And it allows them to communicate better with their other disciplines as well as other agencies. Okay. Now, change will affect all aspects of project delivery. So if you look at all of these different elements of project delivery, and if we step back and we think about it, what does hydraulics do? How does it inter interact with these different disciplines? Well, hydraulics engineers basically do their analyses to come up with estimates of flow depth, flow velocity, and flood extents, okay, for, so flood limits. Those are the three primary pieces of information that we ultimately pass on to different disciplines. And if you look about, think about it, every one of these different aspects of project delivery is impacted one way or another. A couple examples. Design. In designing a bridge, we have to know how high to place the low core of that bridge, right? 
that information comes from hydraulic engineers. We estimate depths, ultimately a water surface below the bridge, and that dictates how high we set the bridge. Okay? Also for design, when we're setting foundations, we need to know the velocity. We need to know how fast the velocity is around the bridge piers, around the abutments, to be able to estimate erosion of channel material and ultimately scour, which then geotechs use to determine the depth of the foundation. Okay? Other example for construction. Right? When we have to place coffer dams during construction, we have to know when we block off half the river, what's the impact? How much do we increase the depths and velocities? Okay? Another example, if we go over to environment. Right? Environmental folks may need, have to, may need to know impact within the ordinary high water mark delineation. Right? We can very accurately provide that with a two-dimensional model. Under that environment, NEPA umbrella, also maybe FEMA floodplain uh, requirements that we can address. Um, there's also several others. I won't take time here, but later on, when we go through our case studies, we're going to use the same icon to highlight how hydraulics interacts with all of these other disciplines. Okay? Now, if you understand and agree with me that hydraulics is important to all these different, different disciplines, wouldn't you think that hydraulics, then, it would be prudent for us to use the best tools available? Okay? Since we interact with so many disciplines, right, it's, it's, it's important, that, therefore, that we use the best tools available. Right, and that's what we're talking about here today. Now, when we talk about tools for change, we're talking about two main components. We're talking about advanced two-dimensional hydraulic computer models, okay, really current day two-dimensional computer models, coupled with two-dimensional and three-dimensional graphical visualization tools right, that can be used to evaluate specific physical, environmental, and habitat um, characteristics. Example here on the left, I don't know if the uh, video ran, but this is just an example of one example of the three-dimensional graphics that we can generate with the software um, showing velocity and limits of floodplain. I don't know if that ran behind my back, but it's not showing currently. Um, I've got some other examples. Now, for our, this innovation, our vision okay, is the widespread use of this next generation tools by hydraulic engineers okay, to improve the quality of their projects, but also to improve their communication and collaboration with other disciplines and other agencies. Okay. With that in mind, then our, our, our vision, or sorry, our mission is to institutionalize the use of these tools across the country okay, by federal, state, and local agencies, ultimately improving the safety and resiliency of transportation-related re transportation projects. Okay. In a sense, we're putting better tools in the hands of engineers okay, so they can produce better projects, better quality projects, okay, and ultimately to have better communication and, again, collaboration with others in their um, DOT as well as other agencies. Now, with that, our main goals are to improve the state of the practice. All right, as I mentioned, what we're currently doing is outdated. We want to change the state of the practice. We want to promote safer and more res resilient designs. We want to provide for improved collaboration, also more efficient project delivery, and we also want to promote opportunities for enhancing the environment through these improved tools. Okay. But ultimately, our goal is to develop a champion in every state. Okay. We want to establish a network between every state. We want to identify either an individual or group of individuals that we can invest in, that we can equip and teach them how to use these tools and then stay in contact with them to maintain the state of the practice. I think that's key. We're not just trying to disseminate this information, we're trying to establish a network. So that's, that's really, I think, our primary goal. So with that, our target audience is primarily DOT hydraulic engineers, but in many states we recognize states, some states don't have a hydraulics group. Okay, so this could include their consultants, and it also includes engineers at all levels. Okay, I didn't mention this earlier, but some states are already using this technology. All right, it's been around for a while, but it's been rapidly developing. And we want to target states that aren't using it, but also states like Petra here is an example, Minnesota. You've been using it for a while. 
this is for you as well. So we want to take and work with states wherever they are and advance their state of the practice. Okay? A lot has happened in the last two years, and our goal is to distribute that and get all states up to speed in using that. In that, we also want to reach a wider audience. Okay? Our main target is DOTs, but in this process, if we can also include the agencies that states work with, we want to do that. It could be um, other disciplines also within the DOT, other counties and municipalities, resource agencies, floodplain administrators, emergency operation managers, and this could be state dependent. Depending on the state, who you work with, could be natural resource agencies, we want to include them in the audience. It's going to be part of the education. We don't necessarily want them using the tools, but we want them to understand what the capabilities are so we can interact with them better. Okay. Now, recognizing that maybe not everyone in the group is, has a hydraulics background, to further convince you that the state of the practice is in need of repair, I want to get, take you back and do, show you a little history. Okay. So let's go back to 1957. Prior to 1957, bridges really were not hydraulically designed. Okay. The design at that point was trial and error. And you can see the result from trial and error. Okay. In 1957, I got a gentleman named Joseph Bradley started realizing that what we're doing by building bridge embankments across riverways we're causing the water upstream to back up. He said, you know, we should probably take a closer look at this and make sure we're not impacting anybody. So he made that recommendation. And by 1960, the Bureau of Public Roads, which was the predecessor to Federal Highway Administration, came out with its first hydraulic design series, or HDS-1, called the Hydraulics of Bridge Waterways. This was the first methodology for analyzing bridges. It was very basic, all right? It just looked at one location upstream and gave an estimate of the impact of that bridge encroachment. Now, who remembers what computational devices they had back in 1960? Anybody? Slide rules, all right? So they weren't exactly efficient. So although we had a methodology, it was still slow. So what they did is they took this methodology, incorporated it into a program called HY4 on a mainframe computer. And then by 1966, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Hydraulic Engineering Center, came along. They got involved in this game. And they generated the first what we call step backwater profile model, okay? HEC2. It was a huge advancement. It, was, it enabled engineers to evaluate a water surface profile from downstream of the bridge all the way through the bridge opening and upstream to get a good assessment of the increase in water surface to evaluate the impact of the bridge. I want to highlight this milestone because the methodology that was released in 1966 is essentially the same methodology we're still using today. Okay? So keep that in mind. From 1966 then to 1984, things continued to develop, but they were still using mainframe computers until the early 80s, right, with the release of the PC. With the release of the PC, we then um, modified HEC2 for the PC, and some other programs kind of came online around that time a little before. One was by the USGS called WISPRO, or Water Surface Profile Modeler, similar to HEC2. And then Federal Highway Administration released a program called Hydrain. And the key thing for Hydrain is that this was the first time that Federal Highways actually recommended that states use the microcomputer and specific software for evaluating hydraulics. Okay. Unfortunately, hydrain has kind of come and go out, gone. We don't use it any longer, but that was kind of a key milestone. And then by 1988, this really marks the first time that Federal Highways used two-dimensional hydraulic modeling. Okay. Now, granted, since PCs had just come out, two-dimensional model would often take months to develop. There was no automated tools and it would take about the same amount of time to run. So it was used on a very limited basis for very unique projects. Now, there was another development about early 90s. Who remembers in the PC world what happened early 90s? Any, any ideas? Microsoft Windows. 
we no longer had to use ASCII files and DOS prompts. Okay, that's what HEC2 was based in. That was big. So in 1996, the Army Corps of Engineers, HEC, released HEC RAS, which was awesome. It had a graphical interface. It helped with data entry. We could plot profiles and see pretty pictures. However, it was still the same engine that was used in 1966. Just a graphical interface was added. Hey, keep that in mind. Now, on the other hand, on the bottom of this slide, two-dimensional modeling continued to develop from 1988. And by the time, around 2012, this was kind of a milestone in that Federal Highways officially put out documents saying, recommending that states use two-dimensional hydraulic modeling for evaluating flow in co at complex bridges, or evaluating bridges with complex flow conditions, right? This document you see here, you can't read it, but it's called HDS7, Hydraulic Design of Safe Bridges. And in it, it recommends all the different types of scenarios where we recommend two-dimensional modeling. And to be honest, it's probably a majority of bridge crossings. We don't often see too many simple bridge crossings, okay? But you might be familiar with HEC 18, okay, or our SCOUR document. We also recommend the use of two-dimensional hydraulic modeling. However, when Federal Highways recommend something, does that mean all states just jump on board and automatically do it the next day? Well, of course not. So, but that's why we're in EDC, right? We've been recommending this since 2012, and states have been slow to adopt this. And there's a number of barriers that Roger will actually talk about later. But before we do that, let's look into the future. Oh, actually, I have an analogy for you. I was jumping ahead. Let me show, give you a little analogy to compare our technology and hydraulic modeling to, say, my first truck, okay? My first truck was a 1969 Ford pickup, all right? I love that truck, all right? How many of you remember your first car, okay? How many of you are still driving your first car, okay? Aside from maintenance, why not? Okay, like me, you probably have a newer car, okay? I heard a couple things, why? The bells and whistles, okay, so user friendliness. What else? Why aren't we still driving 1960s cars? More efficient, okay, efficiency. Power, sure, power, more power. Safer, there's the man from Federal Highways back there. Yeah, safety, um, more resilient. You could go on and on, but hopefully you get the point. We're still using modeling technology that's similar to my old 69 Ford. Okay? We need to change. Right. Let's take a quick look into the future. This is actually a three-dimensional hydraulic model that we're doing at our research lab in Turner Fairbanks. And we're using three-dimensional modeling to actually model the flow through bridges, through piers, and also modeling the scour that occurs below the bridge. This is amazing stuff. Now, we're not inferring that states start using three-dimensional modeling. This is still requires a mainframe computer. But I can tell you that we're doing research with 3D models to better understand the results of 2D models. And ultimately, we want to integrate some of these features that we're learning from 3D modeling into a two-dimensional model. Okay, so hopefully, in the next five to 10 years, we hope to be able to predict scour through a bridge with, directly with a two-dimensional model. But as we do this and we move into that, if we don't get states up to speed on two-dimensional modeling, they're even going to be farther behind. Okay. So now I've given you some history. I've given you all the intro. I'm going to turn it over to Roger now. And I know some of you don't have a hydraulics background. So when we talk 1D, 2D, 3D, Roger's going to introduce some of the concepts of hydraulic modeling. While we're switching the microphone, I'll just say that Scott has made me depressed because of that history section. I remember putting cards in HEC2 and running HEC2 way back then, so it's been around for a long time. All right, can you hear me? Well, thank you, Scott. I appreciate it, and good morning to all of you. It's a, it is a pleasure to be here and to talk about this very important topic. I'll turn this around here. What I want to start talking about is some hydraulic modeling concepts. And the first concept I want to address is who relies on hydraulic modeling. And Scott has already touched on that, and I want to reinforce that. 
as it says up here, multiple DOT agents or DOT offices are supported by hydraulic modeling. Not only hydraulic engineers, which most people assume are, uh, rely on hydraulic modeling, but when we talk about project delivery, we're talking about geotechnical engineers. We're talking about structural engineers. We're talking about environmental specialists, all of those members of the project delivery team. Outside of the project delivery team, we're also talking about the maintenance and operations folks who often rely on the outputs of our hydraulic models, as well as emergency response teams use hydraulic model outputs. And then when we talk about our partners in local floodplain administrator offices, uh, environmental resource agencies, they also rely on the outputs of hydraulic modeling. So there's a number, there are a number of users that take advantage of what hydraulic models provide. And in terms of the design, as it says up here, hydraulic modeling outputs are critical for designing safe and sustainable bridges, safe and uh, sustainable hydraulic structures. And as Scott alluded to, the main outputs that we're interested in there are the velocities in the flow as the water interacts with our transportation structures. We're interested in the depths associated with those velocities and in terms of the floodplain extents. So I want to give a brief little background, especially for those of you who are less familiar with uh, hydraulic modeling. We're going to be using these terms 1D, 2D, 3D, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional frequently. And in terms of what, that inf what the information is that are being provided, one-dimensional models, when we apply those, and we've applied them for 50 years, as Scott said, we put blinders on and we say we know what direction the velocity or what direction the flow is going. And we produce at a given cross-section, like it's shown up here for this one bridge crossing, one velocity, an average velocity representing everything going across that cross-section, one water surface elevation, and then the floodplain extents associated with that. That's what we've been doing for 50 years. 2D modeling takes a tremendous step forward in what our understanding is about what's going on in a particular cross-section. We no longer limit it to one, uh, one parameter. We take those blinders off. We let the modeling tell us where the flows are going. And as you can see here with the color coding, we begin to see a variation of high velocities and low velocities across a channel. And that's very important information that helps us design our piers, our bridges, our embankments, because we have much more of an understanding of what's going on right adjacent to our structures. That's where we're trying to emphasize in this change initiative, is moving more people to routine use of 2D modeling to take advantage of that knowledge. 3D modeling, uh, Scott started to tease us a little bit on that. That not only allows us to vary laterally, but also to vary vertically. So as you could imagine, we get even more information about what's going on in each individual cross-section cross with three-dimensional modeling. As Scott says, we're not quite ready for prime time with that, but that's something that we're looking forward to being able to use in a more regular basis sometime in the future. So let's go out to the field and see what this di difference between one-dimensional and two-dimensional modeling might mean to us. Here we have a photograph. We're looking downstream. A river is uh, going around a bend, and you can see over here, hopefully, that there's some erosion on this roadway embankment because the uh, stream is attacking that embankment. Now, you can also notice, if you look closely, that we have rougher water, faster water over here on the left-hand side, and we have calmer water on the inside of the bend. So if I highlight that with this color coding, you can probably imagine that in the red area on the left, we have a higher velocity area, and on the blue area on the right, a lower velocity area. Two-dimensional modeling allows us to capture that variation across the river. One-dimensional modeling treats the entire stream as one cross-section. So which of these two representations, and I've kind of teed it up for you since it's a morning in the morning here, which of these two representations do you think is going to be more useful to the design engineer in analyzing and designing a mitigation strategy for protecting that roadway embankment? 1D, 1D modeling or 2D modeling? 2D modeling, yes, okay. I did tee that up to, uh, nicely, so thank you for paying attention there. So let's look at another field example. This is a little more complex example, but we have a river coming in at the top here, 
And you, I'll highlight it in a moment, but there's a side channel coming through here. So the flow splits between the main channel and the side channel. And in 1D modeling, we have to give it an indication of how much flow goes each direction. So again, we have to know in advance what's happening. In 2D modeling, it uses hydraulic principles to balance that flow. And then we have a couple of perhaps interest points in this particular case. Up here in the left, we see another one of those bends. And we see a roadway here that could be threatened by that higher velocity on the outside of the bend. And we see that we're interested in two bridges. Whoops. Let's go back here. We see two bridges, bridge over the side channel and a bridge over the main channel. Again, 1D modeling sets it up so that we have one uh, property of velocity and depth at a cross section. So with these complexities, which kind of modeling do you think would be more appropriate, 1D or 2D modeling? 2D modeling because of the complexities, absolutely. So let, let me, um, that's, that's the end of the tutorial about co modeling concepts. We're not going to go any further than that. But let's use our polling. I want to see what kind of background you may have coming into this presentation. Were you familiar with 2D hydraulic modeling before this presentation? So if you could text to uh, that number, A or B. I don't know if that's one person so far or two people so far, but I'll give you a minute here. Right. That's kind of exciting. It's kind of like a horse race to watch those things go. <laughs> right, right. All right, well, that's pretty much what I expected in terms of having some knowledge, because uh, I recognize some of you here. And uh, I have another question for you as well. So let's go on to the next one. Here's a question you may, and I'm going to reword one of these uh, choices here. I want to get a sense of whether you know in your state or organization that you're primarily using 1D modeling, you have some 2D modeling, that would be B, and then C is not, let's ignore the not using anything. Let's say you're not sure or you don't know. So if you could respond to this poll as well, I'd appreciate it. So we've got that horse race going again. So again, a mix. We've got a mix of representation here. And Scott's going to talk a little bit more about what the team's assessment is about the widespread use of, of two-dimensional modeling. And you can give us some feedback on that for your particular state or organization as well. All right, well, let's go on. I want to put this uh, change initiative in some context. Uh, we're trying to move the hydraulics field, which is important for all of these other disciplines, into the next generation. That's where we get the change acronym, where we're using 2D modeling. Many other disciplines have already made that move because they've recognized the benefits of using advanced numerical modeling techniques for their various uh, objectives. And I want to use this bridge as a platform for discussing very briefly some of those. For example, in traffic modeling, we use high-performance computing platforms to estimate the numbers and sizes of vehicles that are going to be going over our bridges. We also use uh, computational structural mechanics for car crash simulations to evaluate the effects of that. And uh, lest you be worried about Thor, the dummy here, he looks pretty uh, crumpled up there, but he's going to pop up and be ready for the next digital simulation without any problem. There are several other examples. Uh, we use finite element modeling to analyze loads on the structural elements of our bridge. And we use computational structural mechanics for analyzing our superstructure as well uh, to see what the effects of extreme loadings on our bridges might be as well. So there's a lot of application of these advanced numerical modeling techniques that we're promoting here with this change initiative. Shouldn't we also consider not only what's going on the bridge or in the bridge, but looking at the foundations, the bridge foundations. Now, one of the key elements of the bridge foundation is bridge scour. We need to know what the scour depths are to uh, design our bridge foundations. And we need hydraulic modeling to evaluate 
what that scour depth should be. We need to know what the velocities are. We need to know what the depths are under our design conditions. So I'll ask the question for you, should we be using the current state of the art to design these bridges so that we get our best scour estimates and can use a, have a good investment strategy for how much we should spend on our bridge design. I would argue that our one-dimensional modeling where we've simplified our analysis, we've put our blinders on saying we know where the flow is going to go and come up with one velocity is not the best way of, of uh, pursuing our foundation design. We do need to move to our two-dimensional modeling. Now, I've just given an example of why I think hydraulic modeling is important for project delivery. I want to talk about a, a number of other areas where this kind of importance becomes apparent. Evaluation of flooding potential and impacts. We often deal with floodplains. Who's affected in the floodplain? Who's not affected in the floodplain? We don't want to overestimate that. We don't want to underestimate that and put people at risk that shouldn't be put at risk. So we need to use advanced two-dimensional modeling for that purpose. Locating and sizing culverts and bridges. That's uh, part of what we've been talking about, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, investment in our transportation infrastructure, and we want to make sure that we're putting that investment in the right places. I've already talked about this one, the evaluation of scour potential. We need that, those hydraulic outputs to properly estimate what our scour potential is. Assessing climate change inputs, impacts. We don't know what the future is going to bring in terms of climate change, but with advanced numerical modeling, with 2D modeling, we have a better chance of trying to understand what the potential impacts of climate change scenarios might be so that we can design more robust structures today. And then addressing NEPA concerns, particularly habitat impacts. Uh, we'll give an example or two about how two-dimensional modeling helps us with understanding the effects on habitat in aquatic organisms for fish because we're talking about velocities and depths in those cases and that's what our advanced numerical modeling helps us with. Now we're not just promoting this as a group of people with representatives from FHWA and consultants and stakeholders. Even Congress has recognized the importance of advanced numerical modeling. Some of you may be familiar with this phrase in MAP 21 and I'll read it to you. Uh, the Secretary of Transportation shall encourage the use of advanced modeling technologies during environmental, planning, financial management, design, simulation, and construction processes of the project. So all of those things that Scott talked about, Congress, which doesn't agree on much these days, managed to recognize the value of this advanced modeling techniques. Now one of the ways of, con uh, of communicating some of these benefits is through a few case studies. And I want to go through a couple of case studies to illustrate where two-dimensional modeling provided benefits that one-dimensional modeling either could not have or would have been very hard pressed to. And before I get into this one, I want to point out that I've put this icon that Scott introduced earlier on this case study and you'll see it on each other case study so you'll get a quick overview of which of the areas are uh, illustrated in the particular case study that we're talking about. So this one has planning, emergency relief, construction, design, and environment implications where the 2D, 2D modeling helped in all of those areas. This example is in the Skagit River, as you can tell, where we had a roadway embankment that was being threatened by the river. So it was necessary to come up with some sort of solution that would protect the roadway embankment. But one of the particular challenges here was this was also a location for endangered salmon. And so preserving habitat was also a critical factor in the design. What was done was a two-dimensional model was prepared. And you know that because you can see variation in the color schemes across there. And a one-dimensional model would not have been able to show that kind of variation. And you can see that along the embankment, this particular uh, design shows blue, which means a reduction in velocity, which means it achieved the engineering objective of protecting the embankment. And you can also see around these dots, which are referred to as salmon reds. I don't know if you're a 
salmon expert or not, but that basically indicates a habitat location, the spawning location. You can see that in most of these areas, there's very little change by the project. And so this very important communication tool was not only essential in solving the engineering challenge, but it was also essential for demonstrating to the resource agencies and communicating to the resource agencies what effect, if any, this project would have on the habitat. Another example is on the North Fourth, North Fork of the Stillaguamish River, where you can see there's a river running parallel to uh, some hillsides and a state route going through there. About two years ago in 2014, there was a massive landslide that buried the original stream channel and buried much of the roadway. So this created a tremendous need for an emergency response plan to determine not only how to uh, address safety concerns, but also to get that road back open. Since the topography had essentially been completely changed, the best course of action was to develop a two-dimensional model of the new situation, which you can see here. Uh, all, we, all that was required was to develop uh, the topography, the new topography, create the model. Remember, the model tells us where flows are going. And you can see by these tracers what the dominant flow patterns were for this particular scenario. With this two-dimensional model, the engineers were able to evaluate the risks of different strategies to satisfy the emergency operations goals and also to get the road open relatively quickly. So here, the, it proved its uh, benefits. I'm going to turn it back over to Scott for a few more examples. We have to change it up to keep you guys all awake. No. Get you excited for change. OK, so this example here is a project on the uh, Dungeness River in the state of Washington. And there's a bridge here in the center of the screen, highlighted in orange, as well as a relief structure. And we've got the main channel and a, actually a secondary channel. This bridge was identified or is assessed to be scour critical, okay? meaning that scour could potentially undermine the foundations and it was unsafe. So the state of Washington started to come up with a plan of action okay, to mitigate for that. They initially put together a one-dimensional model. Okay, and if you're not, if we haven't gotten this across yet, a one-dimensional model consists basically of a bunch of cross-sections that are placed by the user. And the location or, and the orientation of these cross-sections is key. Because the user has to lay this out such that every portion of this cross-section is perpendicular to the flow. So if you understand that, the user has to know the flow direction as he's setting up the model. Right? So in this case, you can see these little dog legs over here to kind of represent the secondary flow path. But again, the flow direction is dictated by the user. I'm going to show you some typical results from a one-dimensional model. Uh, first of all, a profile along this solid yellow center line. And then a cross section at this section highlighted in red. All right, so this upper one plot is the profile. So is the ground elevation along the center of the channel. You can see the blip that represents the bridge, and the blue line represents the water surface profile. The bottom is a cross section at that, this, this red section looking downstream. You can see the ground represented, and the blue line represents the water surface. Okay? As Roger said, a one-dimensional model computes a single representative water surface across the entire channel. Okay? Those are assumptions we've been making for years. Well, in this case, the state of Washington started taking a closer look at this and said, you know, this is one of these complex cases. Maybe we should do a two-dimensional model. And in fact, when they did, they found that the true water surface elevation varied across the channel up to two feet. Okay? And so what the two-dimensional model does, as Roger said, it computes the water surface and velocity at multiple locations. And it doesn't make any of those assumptions that we do in a one-dimensional model. So if you can imagine, if this is the correct water surface, for, for whatever reason, we won't go into the details, there's a higher concentration of flow on the left side of the channel. So knowing this, if you go back to this image, do you think that would change the flow distribution of how much flow goes this way through this culvert versus through the bridge? Certainly. Okay. So in this case, there's more water going through the bridge than we're estimating. 
Okay, so in this case, we'd be underestimating scour, possibly leading to why this was bridge resulted in a scour critical state. I, I don't know. I didn't go into that depth. But more importantly is just understanding that there's a difference. Now, I don't want to leave you with the understanding that two-dimensional model results are always higher than one-dimensional. Okay, that's not the case. It is in this project, but not always the case. Totally project uh, specific. Now, let's look for this project, what the two-dimensional model approach would look like. Okay? Instead of cross-sections, we have what we call a mesh or a network of elements. Right? These are thousands of triangular or, or rectangular elements. Now, I realize, is, I realize it's a bit overwhelming, but you don't have to, the user doesn't have to go in and draw each one of these elements. Now, back in 1988, when we did our first 2D model, that's how it was. But now this process is all automated, right, Petra? Okay. This is much easier. Let me ask you, is this easier to set up than a one-dimensional model? So, and we're kind of in that transition period. There's a lot of one-dimensional modeling, a lot of two-dimensional modeling. Okay? But to set up a two-dimensional model now, it's, it's automated. The user basically specifies the limit of the project area, the, the size of the elements, generates this mesh. Then we add the topography. And so these are color contours that represent the topography through the bridge. You can see the embankments. Okay? But some of the new tools that we have with this technology is that we can also now view this in 3D. Right, so we can rotate the site. You can see the bridge embankments. You can imagine how much this can be used as a tool for communicating to others on what, this, what, what your site looks like. And for that matter, it's a great element of quality control. You can easily look at your topography and see if anything, like there's any odd really things that stand out. So not only can we look at contours, right, we can take an aerial image and drape it over that surface. But once we have results from the model, we can superimpose those results all right, and continue to view that in 3D. This is an example of velocity color contours, the red being high velocity, in this case, almost 10 feet per second. But then the limits of these color contours represent the limits of the flood extent. Okay? So we're looking at both flood plane and velocity contours. Now we can also look at velocity vectors, right, which tell us the direction of flow. That's another thing we don't have from a one-dimensional model. So for those of us that are working in, in, in assessing pier scour, if we take a closer look, you can see these vectors that are approaching this pier at, at an adverse angle. This information is not available from a one-dimensional model. Up to this point, hydraulic engineers have to estimate that. Okay? It can be very subjective because you don't know exactly how this flow is contracting and how much of an influence it is on a piers. Right? And so it's, this is good to know information. As I'll say probably multiple times, we just don't know what we don't know. Okay? A two-dimensional model opens up a whole realm of understanding, a bigger realm of understanding for bridge hydraulics. So in this case, we see flow direction, we see velocity magnitude. I didn't mention this. These are the piers, these little holes. Okay? Those represent the piers. Let me give you another example. This is Sacramento Wash, a project I worked with the Arizona DOT on. This is a county road. The white line you see down the center of the screen. Now this wash is an ephemeral wash, right? And when it and there's no there's currently no bridge. So on a frequent basis, when floods when the floods come, it washes sediment over the road and it becomes a huge maintenance nightmare. Okay? The, the county wants to get rid of this. Right? Their solution, their consultant came up with a solution to design a bridge crossing and channelize the flow and put all of the frequent flows underneath the roadway and minimize the maintenance. Right? Well, the engineer did an outstanding job, really the best job he could of developing a one-dimensional model. You can see these cross-sections laid out, trying to identify all the different potential flow paths. Okay? They added some dikes and some other features, and they said, all right, here's the design. We've got it. The flow is going underneath the, underneath the bridge. Well, we took a look at it and, and said, you know, let's, this is pretty complex. Maybe we should look at this with a two-dimensional model. And, indeed, and indeed, they did. We recommended that, and they did. And they found that actually the flow is still overtopping the roadway in three different locations. Okay? Because the assumptions that were made in the one-dimensional model were too extreme. They just did not apply. 
if you take a close look, it's kind of hard to see these vectors, but there's flow going in every different direction. How in the world would a, the modeler try to decide where the flow is going in order to model it in a 1D model? It's just not doable. Okay? And as a result, we end up with some really bad assumptions. Okay? Here's another example. Shell Creek, eastern Nebraska. Okay? This, was, uh, this, this roadway here, I can't remember, the call, uh, Highway 82. Um, there's a main bridge off to the side. This is a relief bridge, and then this is overtopping. Okay. The interesting thing here is that this roadway was designed for 100-year capacity, meaning that the, it was supposed to pass the 100-year flow without overtopping the roadway. Problem is, a few years after construction, this five-year storm occurred, less than a five-year storm. What's happening? It's overtopping the roadway. What went wrong? Okay. Hydraulic engineers designed this for a 100-year storm. It should pass a 100-year storm, right? Well, it didn't. What went wrong? Well, this was another case where they used a one-dimensional model. They had to assume flow directions to start the project, and those assumptions were not, uh, not ap appropriate. In this case, when you're standing out here, to be honest, it's so flat, you can stand there and you can't tell if water's going uphill, downhill, left or right. Um, so you can t imagine how hard it would be to lay out a hydraulic model for a one-dimensional approach. If we look at it with a two-dimensional model, again, these are contours from, these are velocity contours and velocity vectors. What I want to highlight here is that what we actually found in the 2D model is that flow is spilling out of the main channel into the, the left overbank area. So this, it's, it's distributing more flow to the left than it is to the right. And that's not something that a, a 1D model evaluates. And what happens is that additional flow has to try to make it back to the relief bridge or the main bridge. And since there's more flow, it kind of gets constricted here and it overtops the roadway. Okay. Again, much more information with a 1D model. We just don't know what we don't know. If we look at a cross section, well, I guess I've got some flow paths to show you here. But if we look at a cross section along the highway here, so along this red line, we're going to look downstream. A two-dimensional model would give you that result, give you that varied water surface through the main bridge, through the relief bridge, and the overtopping. A one-dimensional model result looks something like this. It's an average water surface across the entire opening. Okay? Which one's more appropriate? Obviously, two-dimensional modeling. We're learning a lot of lessons like this. Okay? Again, we have these better tools, and we can do better. Here's an example of a typical animation you can generate in a 3D view, kind of an oblique view, of the 100-year hydrograph. So this is a 100-year storm. You can see flows coming and overtopping the roadway. Again, think about using this to communicate with others in the DOT and other disciplines on what's happening. Okay? Instead of just having a profile or a table or a cross-section, these visualization tools are very useful in communicating. A couple other quick examples, I won't spend as much time on these, just to give you an idea of the resourcefulness or usefulness of two-dimensional model results. Again, velocity, contours, you can see around the bends. This is the Wabash River in Illinois, high velocities around the bends. And in this case, there was a meander bend cutoff that's now threatening this I-64 bridge because, you know, it used to have a nice straight approach. Once it cut this bend off, flows are now kind of have this adverse approach on, that, on the piers, on the abutments, we can utilize two-dimensional modeling to evaluate that impact. Okay. Close to my home in Colorado, in 2013, we had uh, significant floods in the Front Range. Um, this is the Big Thompson River between the uh, city of Loveland and Estes Park. I, I put this example up there because you all probably understand super, super elevation in a roadway. Okay. Around a tight bend like this, flow acts much the same way. Going around a tight bend like this, the water surface estimated on the outside of this bend is about three feet higher than on the inside of the bend. Okay? With that, it provides us much better information to design the new profile of the roadway. Okay? With the one-dimensional model, we don't get that effect. Okay? You cannot predict that super elevation. And I just, I don't want to go into depth here, but with the tools that we have available in two-dimensional modeling, we can also streamline design. This is an example where we entered the riprap sizing equations for countermeasure design into the 2D model, 
and we can actually generate contours that give us an idea where different rock size is necessary to now protect this road embankment as it's rebuilt. Okay? Currently, we typically do this site by site. These new tools allow us to automate this kind of thing. Right? One example in Mobile, Alabama, again, this is just a, using a 2D model to evaluate the impacts of climate change, um, sea level rise with different storm surges. Right? So you can see the different shading. This kind of thing you could never do with a one-dimensional model. Okay? Two-dimensional model can evaluate these incremental impacts with different uh, sea level rise scenarios. Okay? Now, I've, we've gone through all those case studies. Hopefully, maybe you can relate to a few of those. I'm going to turn it back over to Roger, another handoff here. He's going to start to talk about some of the benefits okay, and some of the barriers I alluded to earlier of using two-dimensional modeling. Thank you, sir. Right, well, I think you've seen many of the benefits through these case studies that we're talking about. So I want to summarize that, put it in a broader perspective, and then talk about the, the barriers, as Scott indicated. This little pyramid encapsulates what we think the benefits, the primary benefits of this change initiative are. At the foundational level, we have improved accuracy and confidence of hydraulic variables so that we have better and safer structures. And I think you can see that in terms of how we better represent the velocities, the distribution of velocities and depth that give us more information, a better understanding of what's going on, which allows us to design our projects better. Built on that foundation, that better understanding of hydraulics allows us to collaborate with our project delivery team members in a much more substantive way. Those geotechnical engineers, structural engineers, environmental specialists that I talked about before. We can not only communicate with the two-dimensional and three-dimensional visualization tools, but we have better knowledge as well. And then built on top of that, the visualization, the animations, the 2D representations help us with our project partners outside of the DOTs or outside of our agencies. And those are the local floodplain administrators. Those are the environmental resource agencies. And in many cases, these are powerful tools also for communicating with the general public, adjacent landowners. So these are what we see as the benefits of moving in this direction. Why isn't everybody doing it? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. We'll see if this responds or not. But the question I want to ask you is, based on what you've seen today and what your own knowledge within your agency is, what are some of the barriers that you might see in implementing more widespread two-dimensional modeling? And since we have a small group, I'm just going to ask you to, to say something. So what, what are some of the barriers that you think might be in the way? Yes, sir. Just, just the level of expertise to be able to do this. Okay. Um, I mean, our, our state's extremely interested in this and wants to move forward with it, but they're just worried about if you know if it, if it requires a huge resource or a lot of consultant expertise, you know, it may not be practical. Um, and so, if they can train in-house staff appropriately, I think that's going to be the best way to move it forward. That's definitely a good one. Yeah, thank you. Others. You know, the, the 1D technology, like you say, has been around for 50 years. There are thousands of bridges in the ground that are a testament to it may be uh, conservative, mm -hmm. but it does work. Okay. Um, so the just the validity of the, the 2D answers. Okay. And, we hear, and, and that uh, confidence, I think, is an important one. Uh, the conservativeness, uh, the example that Scott showed, showed the 2D gave higher results. So then you have to ask yourself, what is conservative and what isn't? But I, we hear that a lot. We hear that a lot. Other, other comments about what the barriers might be? I mean, it seems like a no-brainer in some respects. Here's a comment over here. Yeah, I think there is a perception that it does require specialized expertise to do this and to set it up. So I think maybe part of this should maybe try to identify when when do you, when is 1D still maybe okay mm -hmm. and when do you really need to go to 2D okay good good anything else that you might uh, see as a potential barrier to uh, moving towards more widespread two-dimensional modeling here thank you for 
How long is that cord? <laughs> um, from from Illinois, another another item our, our state has expressed is how how often do you need to do this on and what complexity of the project is it worth the investment and the time to do this change? You know we're already suffering under limited staffing and limited funding, so it is going to require extra effort. Um, if it's not utilized all that often, is it worth all that effort? Okay. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's uh, let's move on then. I we've capped uh, through our own brainstorming with our team and through discussions with uh, state DOT folks. Uh, we've come up with a list. You've touched on many of that list already, but let me go through that. Perception of effort and expense. This is something that you've said. And sometimes I would say, or oftentimes I would say, that's a misperception, but we'll talk about that more. Awareness and training for staff. Obviously, you can't use a tool if you don't know it exists. And obviously, you can't use a tool if you're not trained to use it. That's another one that you've already touched on. Lack of guidance documents. How do you put these models together? How do you run them? And often overlooked, how do you properly interpret the outputs of these models? So there needs to be guidance for that. Instilling confidence, I think you mentioned that. We have a good degree of confidence in 1D models because, because we've used them a lot. Not necessarily because we're sure that they give us the best answers, but we need to instill confidence in users in these two-dimensional modeling. So that's a potential barrier. Partner agencies may not accept 2D models. We don't work in a vacuum. We do work with resource agencies. They may have a lack of familiarity with the 2D modeling. Scott provided an example of the, the profile and the cross-sections. That's what people are used to seeing. And if you show them something different, who knows exactly how they're going to react to that. So that's a potential barrier that we see as well and that we've heard. Availability of mapping data. Well, to give this more detailed representation of the terrain, we need that terrain data. Ten years ago, that was a bigger problem than it is today, but that's still a concern in some areas. And then, this is one that you've mentioned as well, the learning curve and the investment involved with that. But when you think about it, I mentioned that I use HEC2 cards. There was a learning curve that I went through to use HEC2 cards to make my inputs, to make my output, to interpret my outputs. and so. 2D modeling, just with the uh, car crash simulations, traffic modeling, there's a learning curve with all of these technologies. And we acknowledge that. And part of the change initiative is to address a number of these issues. And I see Scott grabbed the microphone. Do you want to in inject something here right now? Oh, oh you were going to wander. OK. So we do recognize these barriers. Um, they're very legitimate. Um, the one that uh, you mentioned I want to comment on, too, about when do you use one or the other. Uh, Scott mentioned that we are in this transition where people like to compare. You mentioned this, too, Petra, 1D and 2D modeling. I would suggest that once we take that investment, once we make that move up the learning curve, that we probably may not need, we don't need the one-dimensional model, even for simple cases. Once we get effective at using 2D models, there's no reason to to do both. That would just be a supposition that I'd throw out there on, on that particular comment. So doesn't look like this one's going to work either. But since we have a small group, um, how do we respond to those barriers? What are the specific resources that you think might help implement this change initiative in your state? And I think in, your, in expressing your barriers, you've also talked about uh, some of the things that could help respond to that. Money maybe being one of them. But what are some of the other resources that you think would be valuable in trying to move the change initiative forward? I think the training institutes. Is it on? Hello. Yeah, there you go. I, I think training is the key. It's You've got to learn. You have to put the, the time in. And uh, additional classes, the NHI class is very good, um, just to get that out there, to get people trained. And once you have one person trained, they can come back into your unit and train the others. Because once you figure it out, it's not that hard. Okay. 
gentleman over here. In the state of Michigan, the permitting um, department actually does provide that training and for the most part, I think their expectation for most bridges, unless you have a really simple culvert or something like that, um, is that the 2D modeling is really what they do expect. So I think as they created that expectation several years ago, then they offered the training for consultants, agencies. So for the most part in Michigan, um, most agencies, I believe, you know, with any bridge type projects are using the 2D modeling and have been. So, but again, the key thing there was that the agency that was uh -huh. expecting the modeling to come to them for review really was, you know, forthright in providing that training opportunity. Uh -huh. And they provided the expectation that you would use that. Yeah. Others? Yeah. Um, from from Illinois, we would definitely agree with the training that's been said. That's that's very important. The the second thing, the next step is probably developing a user's manual, um, uh, or at least some sort of procedure, a, a written policy and procedure for the states. Um, so any guidance from Federal High would be very useful. Um, we're possibly looking at using stick incentive funds or other ways to possibly hire a consultant to do that for us as well. Okay. So okay, good. Anybody else? Okay. Education. Oh, it came up. <laughs> um, well, we'll skip it. We've, we've gone through this. So now I'm going to turn it back to Scott. And um, what Scott's going to do is give you an overview of where we think uh, states are with respect to this and uh, then talk more about the resources. I'm going to get into strategies and resources, but first, let me just give you an overview of kind of where we think states are at. Now, I don't want to step on any toes here. This is, let me just caveat, this is a work in progress, right? So if, for, if you're looking at your state and you don't agree with the color, let me know. We want to make this, our goal is to actually update this by January 1st, and this becomes the baseline for EDC. Our goal then, with all the states that select this innovation, is to advance all of those states in the next two years to hopefully see as much of the states in green, if not blue, being institutionalized. Okay? So the, the red color being not using or limited use. Orange is considering, but not really using yet. And you get into the, the yellow, where a couple staff members maybe trying it out, maybe attended the training. Then as we get into green, more developing. Well, there's a number of states, and uh, Minnesota's one of them, that has been using 2D modeling for a number of years. Okay, and, and you have a couple staff that are doing it. And, and actually, Montana is one of those as well. And, and I'm going to have JR come out here in a minute and give you his experience. And one thing I want to highlight about the green states is many of them, like Montana, pretty much started using 2D modeling about three years ago. And now they're, they're up, they are uh, going well and uh, using it on most projects. And you'll notice that I don't have any shown as blue or institutionalized. So that's really like the top, is where you're not only using the two-dimensional modeling, but it's integrated in your policies and standard procedures. It becomes part of your everyday practice. So before I get into our strategies, I am going to have JR come up and share with you what their experience has been in getting from, going from the transition from one-dimensional modeling to two-dimensional modeling. So take it away. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Scott mentioned, my name is J.R. Taylor. I work for the Montana DOT. Um, I'll answer a first question that maybe you were kind of wondering. Yes, some of us in Montana do still ride horses to work. Um, <laughs> but you know what else we do? We also use 2D hydraulic modeling. Um, we started about three years ago getting into this. Uh, and I'm going to kind of take you through the why why we made the change, how we made the change, and some of the benefits we've seen from making this change. It all started when we had basically some, some pier scour protection measures on this pier here that were designed with a 1D model that failed. So we knew we needed better answers. 
So we knew we needed to turn to a 2D model. What you can see here is that little square was the original extents of our scour protection measures designed based on our 1D results. What you can see here in this bathymetry survey is the actual extents of the scour hole that formed. Now using the 2D model, we were able to see things like this flow trace where you can actually see that scour vortex behind the pier and how far it's actually going to go. Something you'd never be able to pick up in a 1D model. So next, how did we make this change? You know, starting about three years ago, we first identified project and need. We needed to know better results on that pier scour failure so we didn't replicate our mistakes. After identifying those projects, we contacted our FHWA Resource Center to see what things were available to get some of our staff trained on this new change, this 2D hydraulic modeling. So what we did is we arranged some on-site training uh, for a couple of our staff. Scott came up and trained three of us in our group and uh, we did it over a quick couple days. But really what it did is it got us started down this path of this change. Next, some of that select staff, we attended the NHI training course in a different state um, that was being offered and then we were able to take that knowledge back to our group and continue to share it and really started seeing more and more of the benefits of this change in this new software. Now we're to the point where we have the NHI 2D hydraulic modeling course set up for next May for our entire hydraulic design staff at MDT as well as our consultants because we do use a lot of term consultants to help supplement our staff to keep our project delivery process on time. So next, some of the benefits, you know, Scott and Roger have talked about many of the benefits that we've seen um, for using this. The one I'm going to focus on is the ease of communication with project stakeholders. You know, being able to communicate all of the hydraulic data and stuff in a much easier fashion that everyone can understand. It isn't just a bunch of tables and numbers. First, let me go through some of the project stakeholders. We, you know, we've got our DOT hydraulic engineers and consultant hydraulic engineers that kind of start this. And then your, there's your design stakeholders that we've talked a lot about, you know, your geotechnical, environmental, construction, maintenance, emergency responses, consultants. Then there's this whole other group of project stakeholders, while not, not involved in the direct design of your projects, are very much involved in the acceptance of projects and kind of the development of where they want to take stuff. So being able to have all these folks on board and being able to show them Excellent results is a great thing. Now you can look at this list and kind of get an idea of the varying hydraulic knowledge that some of these folks are going to have. Some of it's going to be pretty extensive and some of it's going to be almost none. So having excellent visualization tools to convey our information is vital. So now I'm going to go through a few project examples. Um, this is a 700 foot bridge we have over the Missouri River upstream of Fort Peck. And you can see here on this uh, north bank here, we've got an abutment that's founded in a sandstone cliff that's been that's eroded 25 feet in the life of the bridge. So the goal was how do we protect that abutment? You know, this is a really long bridge. The detour is like several hundred miles. So trying to replace it's really tough. So what we knew we needed to do was to do a 2D hydraulic model. You can see here the main channel takes a pretty good bend around here. And what we did is we used our 2D hydraulic model to get better ideas on our velocities and flow depths. What we found here is this upstream weir was designed almost perfectly. Pull away your main flows so they don't hit the north bank and they're actually in the center of the channel. This allowed us to pursue, uh, pursue much better design protection measures, a much more constructible, cost effective, and efficient protection measures. My next example, this was a bridge replacement uh, on a county road, in a county road uh, realignment. Uh, one of the biggest stakeholders on this project was the floodplain uh, agencies and the floodplain administrators. Now what you're seeing here, this is a uh, actual flood aerial of a 2011 event that was equivalent to about the 100 year. And everybody can see where the bridge is at, right? No? It's about right there, um, pretty much almost inundated by your flows. And this was a very complicated crossing and we knew we needed to do a 2D hydraulic model. But as some of you guys have talked about confidence in the results. So being able to simply superimpose water surface elevations that were estimated using your model onto a historical flood aerial that those floodplain administrators saw happen instills great confidence. You can go, you know, it's calibrated to that event. So that helps instill confidence that the results we're putting out are accurate. Another excellent, or another stakeholder that was involved in that project were the, were the adjacent landowners. As you guys know, 
every project we do has adjacent landowners. And if there's one stakeholder that can hold up project delivery, it can be those, those landowners. And a lot of it is them just wanting to understand what's going on. And you know, if, when, you're, when you start talking about taking land and stuff with people, it's, it's a big deal. So what we did here with the 2D model is we superimposed proposed an existing floodplain extents. And let me back up just a little bit. This road in its existing condition had a, basically a chance to overtop, like 20% chance to overtop every year. So about the five year event. Our goal, based on uh, it was emergency route out for a lot of people, was to change that to a road that had a 4% chance. So basically we would hopefully pass the 25 year event. Um, we didn't pursue 100 because then you're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars. But then you're talking to the landowners and saying, hey, to do this, we have to raise the water surface elevation upstream almost, five, almost a half a foot. Landowners going, whoa, whoa, no, no, hold on a minute. You know, I don't want to, I'm already, I've already used and lost all this other land, you know, during flooding. How's this going to affect me? What we were able to do is superimpose those two figures and show them that there, there, and there really are only extents where your water surface was going to extend. So being able to take this to a public meeting and sit there in front of those, in front of the landowners and say, hey, this is the change you're going to see is so extremely effective and very, very much easier to get buy off than showing them a, a table of numbers and stuff and trying to explain that to them. Uh, another type of project we've been using 2D hydraulic modeling on, stream restoration projects. Uh, what this was here is this was uh, uh, some land that the DOT had come, uh, come to own through some right of way negotiations. And as you can see on the left side, it was basically a natural channel that was converted into an irrigation ditch for farming practices. And our goal was to gain stream mitigation credits and wetland core credits, which are a big thing for all of our projects now. And by doing some proactive rehabilitation of this stream, you know, creating, so we've got our, you can see the flow trace of the existing condition on the left and then on the right condition. This is also the two year event. This is our redesigned stream where we have reactivated floodplain benches, creating habitat, wetland, and a more, back to a more natural resource. Being able to show these couple of flow traces to a group of resource agencies goes a long way. They're able to see that right side and go, oh, I got you, so you're activating those floodplain benches. You know, you can see these are the same two flow events. You know, what would you want to see? Another stakeholder on these projects, floodplain administrators. Now, as you guys know, anytime we touch water bodies pretty much nowadays, there's probably some kind of floodplain aspect to it. So one of the big things is they say, hey, well, okay, that's great. You guys want to do this work, but I need to see new floodplain maps. This is what our existing one looks like, and we know it's going to look different. So we're able to do, pr produce what the proposed one will look like. And these images, you can pretty much produce in just a couple minutes with a, with a new 2D hydraulic modeling software. With a 1D, you would basically be stuck with CAD and a table of numbers and reproducing that, which would take hours and hours and hours. So now let me go through a couple of frequently asked questions um, that, we kind of, that we find that we get. First, costs. Is this going to cost more than traditional methods? You know, at first, yeah, there's a learning curve. Um, there's, you know, getting some training into that. But in the end, once that learning curve is surpassed and you become more proficient at doing the 2D models, as Petra mentioned, 2D models and 1D models, the 2D modeling is just as easy to build as a 1D. And I honestly believe in the end it's easier because of the less assumptions that you have to make. Um, so in the end, that can help you reduce costs. But then the benefits of a more accurate design will help you reduce project costs. Data collection changes. You know, everybody's kind of got their DOT has their established method for collecting data. You know, you wonder, is food the 2D stuff, are we going to have to collect more data to do this? And the answer is no, especially with the advent of all the LIDAR that's out there available for public use, um, especially for state agencies. Um, there's all the LIDAR. We actually, in Montana, we just bought a new, like, million-dollar photogrammetry camera that we put into our plane to do better photogrammetry. So what this allows to do in the 2D is you can use all that data and then supplement with much less ground data than what you were traditionally gathering for a 1D model. Time, more or less. You know, it's always the biggest thing. We never have enough time. So is this going to take more time? You know, at first I mentioned the learning curve. But, you know, there, was that, there is a learning curve with any, anybody who uses 1D Heckraft's model for the first time. They need to get through that learning curve. And sure, there's help for that. But in the end, once you get past that learning curve for the 2D, I honestly believe it's going to take you less time because it will take less time to develop an accurate calibrated 2D model than it will to do an accurate calibrated 1D model. 
Training, when, where, and how. You know, we've kind of talked a lot about that. There's the NHI training course. There are online tutorials on the, in, in wiki links that will, can actually take a single user through it on his computer if he would like. Um, there's also a users group that Scott started that we meet monthly and we do webinars, um, a go-to meeting, and we kind of get together and talk about things once a month. It's great. And then Scott will talk about some of the other things that we plan on developing as our ADC group. Is it consultant compatible? You know, that's one of the biggest things. Uh, we use consultants to supplement our office. Um, there are some DOTs, that's pretty much all they use. And a lot of the times, like, oh no, we can't do that. Well, I'll tell you what, there's 2D hydraulic software that's free for everybody, including private companies. So there's no reason your consultants say we can't do this. I mean, if you view that you need a 2D hydraulic model on a job, they can do it. And let's, let's go through what those, some of those benefits one more time again. More accurate results. Stuff you'll never be able to get in a 1D model. You can assess the hydraulics at any location within your reach. You know, as we talked about, we set cross sections at certain points and you can only assess them there. With a 2D hydraulic model, you can pick any point you want. It reduces the engineering estimations necessary. As an engineer, this is one of the biggest things for me because if I can replace my guesses, my estimations that I have to make, with fact, I'm going to do it every time. And it's just going to simply get me a better answer. As we talked a lot about this, increased accuracy for scour assessments. This is a big thing because this, this is what publicly causes collapses of bridges and stuff. And people see this, and, oh man, what happened? You know, so if we need better tools to better assess this stuff. And last and certainly not least, as I've talked about, the enhanced visualization tools. Much better tools to communicate our results in our design with everyone. You know, so we're not stuck with, we don't have to just try and communicate off of tables and numbers and where the only people understanding it are actual hydraulic engineers and maybe a few others. We've got great visual tools to pretty much uh, just convey anything we want. And the best thing about it is these tools can be created really quickly for the most part. And we've done it where we've had meetings and didn't necessarily bring a visualization tool we brought to a past meeting. And we had um, resource agencies in the group that were like, hey, do you guys have a flow trace of that? You can bring up the model right there on the laptop and show it to them. It's pretty great. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Scott. Thanks, JR. I promise I didn't pay him to say all those things. No, actually, JR is a, a perfect example of, you know, the, the champion that we want to develop in every state. Okay, that's really, I think, our primary implementation strategy. Petra uh, referred to it. I think that's going to lead to our best success. We want to find that champion or group of champions. If there's a state that have a lot of people interested, we'll do our best to involve them all. Okay? But that's going to be our primary implementation strategy is identify those champions in every state like I said before, invest in them, equip them with the tools, either bring them to the training or bring the training to them. You know, that's going to be one of our proposals that we want to provide free training to every state. Okay? Now, we can't provide free training to everybody across the country, so we're going to have to you know, prioritize. But I know, for example, in Illinois, I know staff in Illinois that are just is so eager to get a hold of the training, but they don't have a training budget. Okay? They've actually been trying to, de to develop their own training based on the, the webinars I've been providing each month. So we're going to take states like Illinois and boom, they're a priority. States that have not been able to access it, but they're hungry for using two-dimensional modeling. We want to bring it to those states. That's going to be certainly a high priority, training, training, training. Along with that, we want to increase awareness. We want to do workshops to reach out to a our other disciplines, our agencies. We want to share experiences that JR is talking about. You know, how can we better communicate with the resource agencies? When you start to show them the results of these different floodplain maps, changes in velocity, change in depth, it, it's amazing how it improves that collaboration. And with that, we're going to reduce that fear and un uncertainty, right? There, there is a lot of unknown. There's new tools. It's kind of overwhelming. We want to get rid of that. Okay? Expanded, oops, expanded access to training. I mentioned that. We're trying to bring the training to states or bring them to the training. We also want to develop some custom advanced training for states that have already been doing this for a while. So like I said, so Minnesota, we want to find out where you're at. What do you need? 
you know, we'll send a team to your state. That's one of your, our proposals, is, is at least. It's like, how can we move you further, okay? Um, other support options, we want to start a blog site, okay, where we can have all these champions contributing and working together. Um, also, we want to work with other agencies. FEMA, for instance, FEMA floodplain analysis, it's been a big barrier. We're going to try to invest in that, see what we can do to provide states with better guidance on how to use two-dimensional modeling for FEMA submittals. We've already accomplished this as far as increasing access to software. As JR mentioned, the primary software that we use and the models we recommend are now free to everyone. We've provided them to states for years, but now that software is free to consultants and other counties and municipalities. So that's, that barrier has been removed. Okay. Also heard mentioned um, need for additional online or user's manuals. Okay. We're going to improve online instructions, try to keep that user man manual live. Okay. We can continue to update it as it goes. As we work with states and we see projects where it's been beneficial, we want to develop those into uh, webinars, recordings, where it, we can demonstrate those practices to benefit other states. Okay. I mentioned workshops already, peer exchanges. For the states that sign on to this, we're going to interact with you to find out what's, what would help you the most. Okay. I heard some questions as far as confidence in 2D modeling results. Right? We're, as part of this, we're going to compile some validation tests to demonstrate how well it does compared to 1D modeling. I've already shown you some case studies. We're going to do more of that, as well as example ap applications, and I mentioned the customized training. Okay. Guidance documents. Okay. We also recognize the need for more guidance documents, both how to model bridges and floodplains in two-dimensional modeling, but also how to prepare a report. Okay. Many DOTs struggle with even like, okay, I've got all this information from a 2D model. Now how do I put it in a, in a report? What's required? We want to write some guidance. And along that line, too, if your consultant does a two-dimensional model, how do I review that model? Okay. How do I even scope a project for a consultant to do? All right. We want to work. We want to write up some verbiage for scoping. Okay. And, and also, how do I in, integrate it into our policy documents? All of that we want to incorporate into this EDC effort. Okay. All right. So closing here, I hope I've convinced you that the current state of the practice needs to be changed. Okay. Two-dimensional hydraulic modeling will indeed lead to safer, more resilient, more efficient and effective designs. And this change innovation will help to overcome all of the barriers that I heard mentioned. Right? They are in our implementation strategies. And change will also provide the resources that your states need to get up to speed on this innovation. So with that, I think we are, have a few minutes left. What, co what questions do you have remaining that we haven't addressed? Questions, concerns? Hopefully we haven't overwhelmed you, more interested you. Are you guys, are, are you convinced? Are you on board? Yeah? yeah? All right, <laughs> Petra is. <laughs> I've been playing with this stuff for a long time. Okay. Yeah, question. You mentioned some of the training that you're going to be trying to provide. What are other sources of training? I mean, are there private, I mean, is there private uh, consultants or whatever that are also providing training? Um, so let me, let me just, uh, first of all, we have, so Federal Highways has developed a specific training course for two-dimensional modeling of bridge encroachments. Okay, very key. And we provide that, so that training is available through NHI. And we use a software uh, program written by the Bureau of Reclamation. It's called SRH2D. The interface is SMS. Now, there are other two-dimensional modeling packages out there. For instance, if you've heard of HECRAS, that's out there, but it currently does not have the full capability to model bridges. It's very important to point that out. Okay? So there is training out there for HECRAS2D, but in a number of states are pursuing that route, but then they find out that they don't do any bridge modeling. So that's important to know. Now, I, I can probably guarantee you that over the two-year period of this EDC, that may change. So this EDC is not necessarily specific to the model that we recommend. We want to keep it more general. But the training we provide is for the SRH2D, and it's certainly what we recommend. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. What other questions do you have? Excellent. Thanks. <laughs> uh, 
uh, as far as the next steps, um, once these summits are over, are we thinking training is going to be provided in the, in the spring? Or um, is this, uh, can they go tomorrow and download the software? Are there other resources available right now? Or are we kind of waiting to unfold and then finding out which states are interested first? Um, so I, I guess, first of all, I want to say that part of my job in the Resource Center is to support states. So if, if you have folks that are interested now, we'll do the best we can to provide resources and help you get going. You can download the software right now. I could hook you up with the existing resources. Okay. Ultimately, I can tell you for Illinois, you need the training course. I've already actually done a half-day workshop for Illinois, and everybody's interested. The next step is to get the training course to Illinois. Um, I can't tell you. This will be training is one of our proposals in our implementation plan. We'll find out early in next year what our funding is actually going to be, and then we'll interact with states and come up with a plan. So, and something I want to make sure I add to that is we have an excellent resource center. Um, uh, as, it, as MDT has found over the last three years, our biggest resource into going down this path has been Scott and his group, who are there to give help for this you know, every day. I appreciate that, JR. And I, as you say that, I think some fo Illinois folks are already involved. If others don't know about it, you mentioned I do a monthly or you know, bi-monthly webinar on two-dimensional modeling. That's the first thing I would hook you up with. If, the, if you know if if you already know champions in your state that are interested, yeah, let's don't wait. Don't wait till this rolls out. So that's a great question. And I'll add on to that. Um, with we, we do the monthly webinar with Scott. We attend it. And actually, the last couple months, we have brought in our entire staff to watch it, as well as several of our design consultants that we use. We've got them into our office to make sure that they're part of this group as well. Okay, it is 9.30. I want to respect your time. Maybe a chance for one last closing question, if anybody had it. And then um, I'll certainly stay late if you have any other questions. Yeah. I just have a comment. Um, the, the end result is very overwhelming and very visual. So we are starting to migrate toward YouTube videos and that you get your results and put it into a YouTube video. And that way you can present all of this information without trying to pick it apart and cut and paste and put it in a paper report. And uh, so we just found that that's a little bit more helpful. That's an excellent idea. And I, I should mention that. I threw up a bunch of our implementation strategies. I should say that that's, this is kind of our draft uh, implementation plan. As we hear from states and those states that sign up, as we hear more needs, we'll certainly accommodate those as much as we can. So. Thanks for the input. If you guys have any other questions or input, please let me know. Again, um, if you didn't get the sign-up sheet, it's probably back there. Okay, thank you. And I also have business, business cards. But again, thank you very much for your time.